Welcome to the Saturday edition of the Fun Astrology Podcast. Thomas Miller on April 8th. We're going to take a look at the sky through the eyes and the lens of our wallets today. Thanks for joining us. We have been blessed by Ray Merriman, one of the deans of financial astrology, as you're going to hear after the newsletter. He had a great personal announcement that we'll share with you. Ray has allowed us to read this column every Saturday. It is published typically on Friday evenings later in the evening Eastern Time on MMACycles.com. This is for the week beginning April 10th. First, a quote from CNBC.com. The Labor Department reported Friday that payrolls grew by 236,000 for the month compared to the Dow Jones estimate of 238,000. The unemployment rate ticked lower by 3.5 percent against expectations that it would hold 3.6 percent. Though it was close to what economists had expected, the total was the lowest monthly gain since December of 2020. Then this from CNN Business. The article is entitled, There are storm clouds ahead for the economy, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO says. Lawmakers are growing more uneasy about raising the debt ceiling, the self-imposed $31.38 trillion borrowing limit they hit in January. Without new legislation, a default by the U.S. government could come over the summer or in early September, according to various analyses. Jamie Dimon, who has worked closely with the White House and Congress this year on various economic problems, told Poppy Harlow that there would be no default under his watch. Not as long as I'm alive, he said. End quote. Ray's comments. It was a shortened holiday week for global markets. However, it was still noteworthy for many markets related to the Venus-Uranus conjunction in Taurus on March 30th. The four-day allowable orb of trading days finally kicked in early last week, April 4th and 5th, for most global stock indices, which ended strong three-week rallies off their primary cycle lows of March 13th through the 20th. In some cases, new highs for this year were attained last week during this allowable time band for a reversal or pause. In Europe, the German DAX soared to its highest level in over a year on April 4th. The Zurich SMI came close to its high on January 17, 2023, on Friday, and near its highest level since June of 2022. The Netherlands AEX rallied to a high on April 4th, and the London FTSE rallied all week. Each is up smartly from their lows of March 13th through the 20th. MMA's last three-star geocosmic critical reversal zone. The U.S. indices complemented one another. Each topped out on April 4th, just three trading days after the Venus-Uranus conjunction. For the NASDAQ, the rally marked its highest point since mid-August. All three indices confirmed their primary cycle troughs of May 13th to 15th. In other markets, crude oil rallied to 81.81, up 27% from its low of 64.36 on March 20th. Both gold and silver rallied to new yearly highs, with June gold testing 2050 and silver crossing $25 on April 5th. Ethereum leaped to 19.14, its highest price since mid-August, but Bitcoin was unable to exceed its high of March 30th the prior week when Venus conjoined Uranus, thus creating a case of intermarket bearish divergence off of the Uranus aspect. Now the short-term geocosmics. Ray says the next 11 days will be filled with several important geocosmic reversal signatures. First, the Sun will conjoin Jupiter in Aries on April 11th, that's Tuesday, the same day that Venus will enter Gemini and trine Pluto in Aquarius. As stated last week regarding the Venus-Pluto trine in air signs, quote, we may get a preview of the coming renaissance I've talked about in this column when Uranus and Pluto trine one another from 2025 to 2028. Well, enjoy the positivity as much as you can early this week, especially with the fiery sun and Jupiter together in the fire sign of Aries. Get out, get active, and connect with those you enjoy. If you need to make a deal or an agreement, now is the time to do so. Hmm, what did we say yesterday? <laughs> Luckiest weekend of the year. By the end of next week, Venus will form a waxing square with Saturn in Pisces. 
Now it gets complicated because the emotions get entangled with the tricks of the mind. You may not know whether to talk yourself into or out of the relationship or agreement. For a trader, this is the dilemma of whether to buy, sell, or hold on to a position. There are too many pros and cons to a decision. Let me make it easier for you. If a market is declining into a Venus-Saturn hard aspect, you buy. However, keep in mind that the following week presents the solar eclipse with both the Sun and Moon in the last minutes of Aries, square to Pluto at zero degrees Aquarius. That happens on April 19th and 20th, depending on where you live. The next day, Mercury turns retrograde in mid-Taurus. Talk about the mind playing tricks on your trading decisions. And the next two weeks could be real mind-benders. Personally, I like the four days surrounding Mercury retrograde. I find my intuition is usually good then, but after that is when the trickster gets on my nerves. And under the longer-term thoughts column this week, a really cool announcement from Ray. He says, This month, astrology's leading journal in the United States, The Mountain Astrologer, has published the first part of my lifelong journey on the development of today's astrological community. The title of this two-part series is My 50 Years of Community Service to Astrology. The first part is now available to subscribers on the Mountain Astrologer website, mountainastrologer.com. If you're interested in how astrology changed from a hobby prior to 1990 to a profession for tens of thousands of today's career astrologers and the role I and other leading astrologers of today played in this transformation, then consider taking out a subscription to this month's TMA, The Mountain Astrologer, and find out how this revolution went down. It is a very Uranian tale told through the eyes of a very Sagittarian Capricornian storyteller. That would be Ray, with the sun and moon in Capricorn and ruling planet Mercury in Sagittarius. Enjoy, he says. It's a good ride. The kind you would think with Mercury in Sagittarius. A few years back, the original publisher of The Mountain Astrologer passed away, and I know he was a very good friend of Steve Forrest's, and there were some very nice accolades during that time. And supporting Mountain Astrologer is a great thing to help keep it going in the astrological community. And that concludes Ray's comments for this week. I wanted to take a look at something that we haven't done on here, I don't think, but it's a great thing to do on this luckiest weekend of the year. I wanted to take a look for just a couple of minutes here at the United States Sibley chart, but not the natal chart from 1776, the birth chart of the United States. I'm looking at the solar arc chart. So with this chart, the planets stay in their same position as they do in the Sibley chart, but the signs and the degrees have changed. The whole idea behind progressed charts, whether it's a solar arc chart or a secondary progressed chart, is to bring the chart forward to where we are today. So where is the United States today, at least as far as these sign positions? Well, the first thing that I, and I'll try to just paint as good of a mental picture as I can here for you without having to look at a chart. So we all know that the United States has been undergoing this Pluto return where it hit the exact spot three times last year in 2022. So my first thing is, where's Pluto? Where's like, where's Waldo? Where's Pluto in the chart? Well, it's at zero degrees Aquarius over our heads right now, and that is approaching a trine to the United States Pluto, which now, in the solar arc chart, is at two degrees Libra. We have an air trine. Transiting Pluto is in the sixth house, the sign of self-integration. Now, this gets interesting. Stay with me here. All right, so transformation, Pluto, the theme of transformation. Perhaps through death and rebirth, yes. And remember, the natal Pluto in the Sibley chart is in the second house, money. All right, so we have that theme that we can at least say, okay, that's present. Look at this. This is interesting. I've been tracking Urania. It's an asteroid, and you can add it to some software programs. 
And Urania shows where astrology or the propensity for astrology is in a chart. It actually is a tie or a pointer to astronomy. And then, of course, we just take the astrological application of that. And interestingly enough, Urania, for about the last six years or so, has been in the United States' 11th house. That's the people. So what's this picture? Well, the air trine, all right, to Pluto in money definitely says there could be some money restructuring. We've covered that so many times. That's in every headline today now. And it's unfolding. I mean, we're talking about other countries abandoning the United States dollar for their international commerce and trade. That's going to have an impact. We just got finished with the Saturn-Uranus square for 21 and 22, and then we had the Pluto return through 2022. That we're going to walk away from this without changes would be astrologically unprecedented, historically too. But look at this. We have an air trine in the house of self-integration. There's no better way to advance your self-integration or your the work that you do on yourself, the encasement of all of who you are, than to go messing with your money. But it's in an air trine, which is giving more power to the people. So as we see all of this, exactly what we've talked about, the authoritarian versus don't tell me what to do contrast of Pluto and Aquarius, we're just getting this little snippet of it from now until June, that if the people will do this self-integrative work, and look at what's been happening with astrology. It's showing up at Sherwin-Williams, Starbucks, clothing retailers. The millennial generation has completely embraced astrology as magnificent. Many have become amazing astrologers in their own right. What they need is a little more time with that Saturn return, but that gives you perspective. And as that perspective is unfolding, they are getting it and they're looking at it through the correct lens, the lens of the sky, the guiding path that shows us why we came here in the first place. This is exactly why we have to hold the highest timeline space for this whole planet. That's you and me. That's our responsibility. We can't go solve all the problems. We can't change the state legislatures. We can't reverse crooked politics, but we can hold the vision that the people will self-integrate positively, eventually, and that astrology is going to be a big part of the guide of this process. Cool thing on that note, Urania will be up there in the 11th house for the next 23 years. Can I have an amen? <laughs> Now, what else do we have in here? Well, let's just summarize maybe the Cancer stellium because there were so many planets in Cancer in the United States chart. Venus, Jupiter, the Sun, and Mercury. They are all now in Pisces. Saturn, transiting over our head, is in Pisces, getting ready to go over all of those planets. That's where the karma is going to unfold over the next couple of years. Let's think about the collective in Pisces. What is one of the big shadow sides of Pisces? It's addictions. It's escapism. Jupiter of excesses. Is that not our culture today? So when you look at it and you shake your head, realize it's in the chart. And with Neptune sitting right on top of all of that Piscean energy for the next several years, the illusion delusion is probably not going to significantly improve. Saturn is going to come through and kick it in the head. But don't forget, Pluto is in the air sign, and this is going to give us more power in the end. The last thing I would point out is that the cusp of the 10th house in this chart is ruled by Taurus. So there's the money theme again. I just wouldn't be surprised if there were not money things coming up for the United States over the next several years period. But remember we talked about astrology? Uranus, the planet that rules it, is sitting right at the cusp of the 10th house. You know how we talk about themes repeating themselves multiple times? Do you get the picture that this chart is saying that, yeah, there's going to be some pain, but there has to be with this collective. It's gone too far. And what that gives us who are living on our highest timeline, the ability to do is to hold space. 
Have you ever done that in a meeting? Have you ever gone to a conscious meeting where they ask participants to hold space in the room, to hold space for the leader of the seminar or for the event itself? You just stand in the intention of why you're there. You are present. You're not focused on other things. You're holding the space of why everybody is there. For example, when we go to Florida in May and I help Fred put on this event over Memorial Weekend, I will be present in the room, not checking my phone. In fact, the phone will be turned off because I'll be focused on Fred and I'll be holding space for him, positive, giving him energy, sending those positive intentions his way through the whole day. It actually is exhausting work when you do it, if you've ever done it like that. Well, that's what we get to do here. And whether you're listening from Australia or Europe or South America or the United States or Canada, our wonderful listeners scattered all over and abroad, you can hold the space for your country and for the world. We really are now all in this together, and that's also part of Pluto in Aquarius. But this is a tremendously responsible role that we have to play here. So don't let the noise get us down. This is the luckiest weekend of the year. And with this, we could say that for the next year, until the sun conjoins Jupiter next year, we are going to hold the highest timeline space possible for this aspect and all these others that the world is going to be a much better place when this is all over. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been the history of all of these aspects going back a thousand years. I'm standing on that. Will you join me? Have a wonderful Easter if you are celebrating. I wish you the happiest with your friends and family. It's a great time for the kids. And for those of you not celebrating, we will have the luckiest weekend of the year. All of us will. And we'll see you back on Monday.